Good turnaround Tuesday, Warriors. How's everyone doing? Good. Something did manifest that I was talking about for last few weeks. 10-year yields, new lows. There you go. And in a big way. In such a big way, um, it's not blowing out the daily divergence. But I don't see any four hours trying to hold. God, it's so close. I could taste it, guys. Everyone hear me okay? Good morning, Craig, Claudia, Tom. Everyone doing okay? Loud and clear, Coach. Oh, Good hey, morning. Steve. Great to have you back. So uh, I'm not sure what news sparked it, uh, but, you know, I was short the yen based upon the correlation. And, you know, something I have to say, you know, I, I took them in because – Really, the yen's acting pretty tough if you just look at the yield picture, you know. Uh, I don't know. I, I was waiting for longs down here. I figured while I was waiting for longs, I thought, you know, yield looked so weak uh, that I thought we'd be here by now, 107.60. So in front of the Fed, remember we have the Fed, everyone. I, so I, I'm doing some book squaring today. Um, my timing was uh, terrible in Euro Pound. You know, started probing that and scaled in yesterday. And I'm still in it, but, you know, I really don't like it because except for the four hour, yeah, see, four hour almost confirmed, but the divergences on EG was completely blown out. So I don't know. See this? So even if the market's starting to come back to me and I see something like this, it makes me nervous and I, I, I'm more in the mood for looking for an out and I don't care about profit or loss. I missed it because I was sleeping. I would have done something here. I may still do it. Anyway, uh, that, you know, uh, a little heat there, but something I was talking about that also happened was uh, Aussie Kiwi. So Aussie Kiwi was holding the 50% retrace here. And it still is, but I was talking about it up here. And to me, it looks like uh, good possibility of it giving up the 50% retrace. And if that happens, and you know, this is a counter trend, you know, I mean, I think Steve and uh, Greg would say this is corrective after an impulsive move, but working off this huge overbought condition by moving sideways. But looks like 60 uh, halfway will give give out. Uh, I may look at it here at 61A because I respect the way it's given it up. You know, you know, tried to turn good off 50%. Maybe one more flush to 61A. That's on my watch list down here now covered shorts there too and uh gold looks uh, destined for another high yeah here we go so talked about this yesterday with blake i thought we'd make a move towards another high the whole world's waiting for the breakout you know what uh my feeling of what may happen in gold is uh confirmed by one of our, my teammates yesterday, Greg, okay? And someone else I interviews, uh, I think it was Will Patton, and he's with Avi, and he showed a chart when I interviewed him, and he's coming up here pretty soon. And this was, I don't know, a few months ago. But he showed a chart that we get the breakout over 1380. And I think Greg has showed it going to maybe 1400 after that. I don't know, maybe 1420. I mean, people are going to be talking 15, 1600 on this because, you know, classically, that's what it measures. You know, you just take this whole range, you know, you could take it all the way from 1050, 300 bucks, tack that onto the breakout. You know, you're talking 1600. That's what a lot of people are going to be talking about here at least 15. 
Oh, here, 1419 is 1.27. Okay. Anyway, so that's what uh, Grega thinks is going to happen. You know, not that there's not good money, you know, from here up to there. Look, it's doing nothing wrong on the weekly it's holding. Anyway, uh, is there any news like the Fed already cut rates the way <laughs> yields are acting today? You guys know what a fundamentalist I am, right? Um, so I have no idea what sparked um, the big drop in yields because uh, it doesn't look like it's risk off to me, guys. S&Ps are challenging last week's highs and I don't know what to do with it. Uh, it looks like it wants to make a new high. So get it over with. Maybe we're going to just rally into the Fed meeting into July. Um, some of my intelligence gathering and a guy who's very good with Gantt stuff that uh, also was interviewed here a few times, Zextra Dax. Uh, has like July 16th or 18th for the most important turning point of the year. So if the market's going up and we're at 3,000, uh, 3025, a lot of targets people have, that may be the play, the inflection point there. Anyway, uh, flat yen, although I still think it uh, has a chance to break back down towards here. And I, I respect the way the yen's acting because with what yields did, it should already be down here. So maybe yields keep dropping. Uh, but I'll, I'll just out of principle, I'm going to have to try longs down here. Okay. So uh, who's here today that's not a member? Anyone? Trump tweeted a Draghi hate message. Uh, okay. Why is he mad at Draghi? Uh, the usual nonsensical stuff. Uh, uh, you mean because uh, uh, the dollar's he, he, too strong against the euro and at, hurting our trade? At, yeah, he's mad at Draghi uh, because um, in his mind, Draghi is, uh, um, you know, propping the dollar by uh, uh, talking the euro, which uh, at that point it makes 100% sense if it was coming from the same person that at the same time claims that, you know, the U.S. has the best economy ever, but the Fed should be at 0% rates and doing QE. So, uh, Steve, how does, uh, <laughs> how do things look? from uh, overseas when, you know, you foreigners look at America now? Uh, you know, what do I mean, you not just your opinion. You talk to a lot of people. I mean, From an economic what, perspective, what are, you know, the vast uh, majority of people don't have the uh, ability to, they don't understand economics. So, um, this, you know, this is, well, this is purely, purely, you know, a comment that has to do with the hypocrisy. Uh, you know, the vast majority of, of players here, and when I say players, I, I include politicians and uh, monetary policy um, uh, heads, you know, they, they're all hyp hypocritical. As, you know, basic examples, you know, you will never hear central banks saying, we're afraid that the recession is coming because, you know, they think that that's going to spark a recession faster or make it bigger. So, you know, by default, they can't be honest about it. So, you know, in the same way, they... They can never be honest about what they're doing or what, what their actual intentions are. At the same time, you know, but, you know, there is a limit. Usually politicians try somewhat to stay out of it. Uh, Trump at the same time, claim, you know, wants to claim that, you know, yeah. the U.S. has the economy ever and that it needs the most monetary stimulus ever. Now, you know, those right. two things don't... don't uh, that, that's not what sparked the drop in yields today. What did, Steve? In general, in, in general, we see that, you know, there are jitters out there about, you know, what's, what's happening with, um, you know, the fundamentals now. Um, okay, know, so no, bonds, there wasn't a catalyst. It's just, there's no news behind it is what you're saying. No, I can explain no, why it's happening. But no, there was real, no, okay. no real news for the U.S. yields, for the bonds to be bid. There are news, Draghi, uh, in essence, pointed to, to more stimulus that the European Central Bank is preparing 
to add more stimulus, and as you understand, that obviously, yeah. obviously yeah. puts a bid under the bond. Now, on one sense, because you know the two benchmark bonds, I mean the treasuries and the bonds are very highly correlated. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure that 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 has uh, has had an effect as well. Yeah, that's in, it. Then. You know, uh, yeah. You know, in, in you know, in parts, definitely yes. Yeah. Okay. Is Blake with us today? I'm guessing. Okay. I'm Blake. right here. How are you, buddy? Hey. hey. Good morning, guys. Yeah. What's happening here, Blake? Turn no, around. You know, yeah. um, just to, I, I guess you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll I'll take over the charts here, but um, we were talking about uh, you were you were talking about what happened to the euro and yields and everything else. Yeah. Uh, you know, the euro dollar came off. Uh, when you know Draghi overnight basically said that that he's looking, um, you know, we we that that the European the eurozone needs more stimulus, and then so the euro actually slumped uh, to these lows, you know, a few hours back, and then we spiked up because Trump tweeted, um, uh, you know, basically, you know, it's unfair how the ECB, uh, how Draghi can can, you know, yeah. Uh, weaken his currency, you know, with more stimulus. Uh, it's, you know, it's basically he was just making the argument that, you know, it's just not fair that 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 ECB could do that. And then right after that, ECB uh, a headline came out that uh, the, the, the ECB officials see rate cut as their primary tool uh, to stimulate the economy. Then the euro came back down. So, so basically, it's a, it, it, you know, it was Trump is trying to, he's trying to, he's trying to, you know. Um, his hardest to to engineer a weak currency, but uh, the ECB is doing a pretty good job at it this morning uh, themselves ahead of the uh, ahead of the the FOMC meeting um, uh, tomorrow. So, and and frankly, I don't know if the the uh, the Fed is going to play ball with uh, Trump's idea. You know, as, as Trump wants a rate cut. Probably you know, more than anything. It so. makes me think, Blake, that you know, if it continues and the dollar continues to get stronger and goes to some of those bulls objectives, that it would not be beyond uh, President Trump to have his Treasury Secretary Mnuchin uh, begin to intervene to weaken the dollar instead of trying to jawbone it. Uh, you know, I think that's what it's probably going to take, and yeah. I, I think I think they would they, eventually they're going to do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's potentially that could could be the case, or you know yeah. maybe Mnuchin may might uh, might actually start with some some uh, rhetoric where he typically will not as Treasury Secretary. So uh, we'll see, and we'll see what yeah. happens tomorrow. He never you talks know. about the dollar. No, but the the Fed um, the Fed is uh, you know expected to uh, keep rates un, unchanged tomorrow. Um, you know, very few feel that uh that they're going to actually cut tomorrow but they're going to pave the way for for future yeah. rate cuts uh, so the question is how dovish is the uh is the fed going to be tomorrow and wow what I mean, if he's hawkish tomorrow no it could, could be i mean it's how, how do you how do you be how do you be dovish when um you know the u.s econ economy and the the economic data that we're getting generally speaking is still pretty strong and i know i mean i know the employment numbers are starting to level off a bit but we all know that you know, we're at, uh, you know, full employment. So, but if you look at all the other data that's out there, um, the U.S. economy is still chugging along nicely. So it's, yeah, uh, you know. Even retail sales Friday was pretty good, Blake. Yeah, it's good. And you look at the PMIs, they're not bad. And, you know, so it's, it, that's why, that's why the argument is how can the Fed be too dovish tomorrow? And, um, you know, yeah, obviously. Some P's at new high, you know, I mean, new recovery hides pressing them here why yeah. would they use any ammo yeah so so we'll we'll see we'll see what happens but I, i'll tell you a few things that are you know jumping out at me today um ab about you know these moves first and foremost let's talk about um let's talk about gold as as you mentioned a little bit earlier uh gold is strong and uh you know gold's strong and we're we're heading back towards that really key resistance around that 1360 level um, we're, we're getting close once again. Uh, it's hard to chase gold up here, you know, obviously ahead of the, ahead of the FOMC, but it looks, it looks extremely strong. It looks like we, we, we could quite possibly break out this week. Um, 
one of the one of the thought processes here is gold is extremely strong because the 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 all all central banks are looking to lower rates or continue to stimulate uh, growth via interest rate policy, which in turn will um, you know stoke inflation. I guess that the thought process would be so you've got you've got gold that's um, getting ready to probe, you know, that really, really key resistance once again uh, at that 1360, 1365 low. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, and, and as you as you can see here that, you know, this is going to be a big breakout in the event that we uh, in the event that we break out I mean, gold could, could really, um, you know, start to squeeze higher. But you've got gold on the move. You've got, um, you know, silver's hanging around near that 15 level, and, and it'll be interesting to see if uh, silver breaks 1510. You know, we can see that outperformance of silver maybe over gold, which would, you know, as we've talked about here, Dale, that we could see that uh, the confirmed move in, in precious metals. So um, that's something that, you know, I'm obviously looking at. The other thing that it obviously stands out today is, you know, take a look at the bond market and, and take a look at Boone's. Boons are at all-time highs, and uh, you know w one of the one of the drivers why the euro is is weaker, or you know maybe vice versa, is one of the one of the reasons why bonds are so strong, is that the euro is so weak. But we have completed um, a you know this is a measured move of this uh, of this triangle. So um, here, let's delete that, and you can see Boons have basically completed that move. And then we have 161% extension, which we're, we're overshooting right now, uh, obviously. But, you know, if the, if Boone's start to, you know, at least consolidate or maybe even pull back here a little bit, that might be uh, the juice that, that gooses the, uh, the Euro higher from current levels, you know, especially ahead of the FOMC. I, I, I'd be pretty, it, it's, it's hard to get too bearish the Euro or bullish the dollar ahead of the, uh, ahead of the FOMC, you know, and especially if you look at some of these other dollar pairs, like the Aussies starting to, you know, find a little bit of support down here. The Kiwi actually is up on the day um, and, and we're holding the support as well. So, you know, you got to, Got to, I think you got to be a little careful being long dollars at this moment. Um, but the the it's not just the boons. You got to take a look at bonds. Look at the look at ten year. Uh, we have that flag pattern, and uh, we're hitting new trend highs. I mean, this is a this is a bull flag pattern. So you can see the bull flag pattern. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to grab. Yeah, I move that. I I didn't mean to move that whole thing here. There we go. Let me let's make an adjustment here. Snap it back to those the highs and lows so you can kind of see what what the extensions might take us to. There we go. Okay. So the bond market you see that bull flag pattern. I mean it points us out to the 127% extension. Uh, which could take us, you know, above 130 in the 10 year. I mean, that's, you know, the potential there is quite aggressive. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if bonds continue to rally like this and yield sell off, the, the question is what happens to like the, the dollar yen? And you look at the dollar yen, which is also threatening, you know, we have this bear flag and we have a bear flag in a bear flag. So, you know, not only do we have, here, let me grab my drawing tool here, but uh, where is the, here we go. So you have this, you know, this flag that could play out lower right here. Then you have another flag pattern. I mean, er everything that I see in the dollar yen points to 107, uh, at least 107 and maybe even lower towards 106.30. Uh, so. Uh, again, you know, the dollar looks weak and it looks like it's it, quite possibly we could go lower. Um, so anyway, th that's just a few things that I see uh, going into today. Uh, I'm going to reiterate really quick and then I'm going to talk, talk to you guys about something else. Uh, I'm going to reiterate it. You got to be a little careful being 
too long the dollar at this point ahead of the FOMC. So knowing that we have the the um, the Fed tomorrow, the Fed meeting tomorrow, just be a little bit careful being aggressively long the dollar at this moment. Um, because with gold moving higher, silver moving higher, you got yields that have um that, that continue to uh to 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 drop um just i think you should be a little careful with the dollar okay now i i want to i want to stop and talk about just take a few minutes to talk about something else if you guys didn't or don't remember from a few weeks ago uh i have a young man or had a young man uh sitting next to me for for uh for uh, a, a few days, um, who is very interested in currency trading, his uh, his 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 brother and uh, my youngest son are on the same uh, uh, baseball team. Anyway, he came came to sit with me for for a week, and we talked about currencies and about what I do. And uh, he's 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 actually quite talented at reading charts, and he's um he's uh he, he's you know been trading the currency market for a little less than a year. Um, and really getting to know the markets. Anyway, he is spending another week with me this week. Uh, he's, he's sitting in my office right now uh, because uh, I went on holiday. He, him and his family went on a little bit of a break. So he had to, he, he was coming this week to come sit with me for, for the remainder of this week, just for a couple hours a day. Anyway, we were discussing about indicators. Okay. And, um, and, and, you know, indicators on our charts and, and, and we were having this discussion about, you know, relative strength. And uh, I'm like, well, I've been using relative strength for the last 20 years. And it's not so much, you know, what the indicator is telling you or, you know, how the indicator is moving, you know, what you should be buying or what you should be selling. It's just how you couple that with what, you know, what you currently do, um, you know, which that's what makes it more, uh, how should I say, um, value valuable to you as an individual trader and then he went on to the question of well you know to be more profitable you know do you add more indicators to to what you're looking at and you know the and some most of you know this answer but i i thought it would be a good talking point especially for today is we all trade the markets differently um, everybody uses a different set of indicators, uh, what they're looking at. Um, what I do and what I found is what I use works for me. And it doesn't mean what I do is the end all be all of trading. Um, what you guys do as traders and what you use as traders is what works best for you. What best suits your trading style, your trading strategy, um, and you're not going to you're not going to make more money by increasing the number of indicators or different indicators that's not how you increase profitability when you're trading how you increase profitability in trading is finding a strategy that works for you that's that that you find fairly consistent results when i say fairly consistent results because you're not going to find an, a, a strategy that works for you all the time uh there's just no such thing but you're, you know, you find a strategy that, you know, whatever technical analysis you're using, whether it's Elliott waves or fibs or, you know, harmonic patterns or, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 um, you know, what, whatever, you know, if oscillators, whatever it may be, you're using indicators that yield you consistent results. 60, 65% of the time, 70% if you're hot, you know, the, but, but you know that most of the time it works for you. Then you increase your size. And then as you increase your size, that's how you increase profitability. You have to find a strategy that works for you. Like I know what works for me. I know, um, you know, when I, you know, see this coupled with that and then, you know, you know, whether I'm looking at a confluence of multiple fibs and then I see a divergent relative strength or, you know, whatever the case is. And if I, if I apply a trade, if I, if I, if I take a trade, the profitability comes from me moving up my position size based on my confidence that I see in those particular indicators. It's not, 
you know, adding another indicator that's going to yield you more profitability. What I see traders do over the years is they end up chasing their tail for years and years and years, trying to, you know, slap this indicator on and that indicator on. And then what happens is four, five, six, ten years go by and then they come back and say, you know, if I would have just done this, if I would have just stuck to that, I would have been fine. And that, and I've, I see that happen over and over and over again. One of the, one of the things that we do here at Forex Analytics and at the FACE webinar is we try to, you know, I, I try to minimize your learning curve as much as possible. Um, and one of the, one of the ways I can possibly do that with what I'm telling you today is, you know, find what works for you and just stick with it and then work on, you know, risk management and increasing your, you know, in, in, in increasing your position sizes versus trying to slap on another indicator because really it's, it's just finding what works for you and then tailoring a good risk management strategy around your entries. All right. So anyway, I thought it was a good conversation to have uh, today, especially, you know, head of the head of the FOMC where, um, you know, markets might be a little muted because um, I, I am expecting bigger moves uh, from tomorrow and throughout the end of the week. So with that being said, Steve, I think you're here. Maybe not. I'm here. Oh, hey. Hey, Coach is here. Hey, hey Coach. How's it There's going? Steve. Okay. I'm here as well. Okay. So uh, did, what, do, you, do you have any comments to make about uh, what I just mentioned about strategies or indicators or anything else no i i mean I'm, I'm in total agreement with you I, uh, I i personally don't see any reason for people to use more than an rsi uh, because you know the best indicator is your uh, trained eye to recognize patterns and an rsi is always useful because it gives you um, a much easier way to uh, to grasp on one look momentum um, I find it particularly funny, which I, I see very frequently, when people use multiple momentum indicators, which are, you know, you use a stochastic and a MACD and um, an RSI at the same time, which all of them tell you the same thing. So, yeah, it's, you know, um, it's what you said, Blake. I couldn't agree more. Uh, teaching yourself, finding a way that consistently works for you. Uh, sticking to it, measuring performance so you know what you've been doing wrong, what you've been doing better to do it better in the future. And, you know, don't clutter your uh, chart with indicators because the vast majority of indicators can be grouped in one or two uh, useful kind of indicators. You know, the rest are just, you know, um, um, uh, you know, the same thing. You know, and, and it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be an RSI. I mean, I use an RSI because that's what I, that's what I learned on. But, you know, d doesn't mean that you can't use a MACD or, oh, or you, got you know, what, whatever, whatever indicators, you know, fits your bill and suits your style. I, you know, I just, I, I happen to use an RSI because it's probably one of the most common. And, and what you probably notice if you haven't yet, um, for those people that have been listening to my webinars for, uh, you know, I started broadcasting about 15 years ago. Uh, when I was with the Wise Trade Group, and you know, m many listeners that are listening in right now have been listening to me for five, 10, 12, 15 years. What every one of them can attest to is my charts haven't changed. My charts look exactly the same today that they do than they did 10, 12, 15 years ago. Minus, you know, I might I might adjust a moving average here and there, but moving average is more. Expo you know, show me momentum versus anything. And it's, and, and I, I just happen to keep a 50 and a 200 day mostly on my charts. And sometimes I'll flip it over to, you know, some EMAs or, but, but all the indicators, all the same. Hey, listen, we have uh, housing starts coming up, building permits uh, as well. Um, and so once this data comes out, I'm going to be switching it over to Steve. Uh, Stelios is not here. So we'll see that data come out here in just a moment, Steve. Stelios is swimming just to make us jealous. <laughs> yeah, swimming in the Aegean Sea. And you yeah. miss carrying around your charts in the chart book era, Blake. All right, stand by. We are for, there we go, about 10 seconds away. Chart book. And I have it on the Euro, but uh, this shouldn't be much of a market mover. All right. So, you know, data is mixed. 
housing starts is actually quite horrific. Huh? See, Trump is right. We need to go to zero. Yeah. You know, just uh, I think it overall mixed data. We're we're not going to see much of a movement here. Um, so especially ahead of the Fed. Yeah, and especially ahead of the Fed. You're right. And there's there's not going to be any any real reaction here. So I think you're going to see some book position squaring going into uh, going into today. Uh, just be be careful getting too uh, too married to any position here. So Steve, I'm going to pass it over to you. Um, you guys have a great one, and uh, I'll see you here tomorrow for FOMC prep. By the way, Blake, okay. quite quite an interesting day, yeah. What with today? How many days you see uh, bonds, gold? Uh, everything bid. It's everything is bid at the moment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty. It's 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 wild. It's, something's gonna break. But I'll tell you what. Um, these precious metals look pretty strong right now. Yeah, they do. They do. Bye bye, Blaker. All talk right. To you talk later. to you guys soon. Bye bye. Hey, coach. Hi, right, Steve. How are you? Good. Good. So. Uh, uh, they're, uh, the yields are blown out some RSI, so you know I was thinking about yeah, by the taking way, a shot uh, here. Boon, ten year, tres, uh, ten year, sorry, um, yeah. boon, uh, uh, minus zero percent. There is your yeah. opportunity. TLT, <laughs> TLT. Uh, I was look. Uh, should it get to that level I've been talking about for a week or so on this uh, one thirty three uh, and a half or so, but uh, you know. Uh, this is a good lesson. So you could have targets and be thinking about positions, but it's not just that it gets to a price, Steve. It's how it gets to a price. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. So, you know, you I mean, remember it, after, right. after 3%, everybody was looking for an explosion higher. And just a few months later, we're threatening to break down below 2%. Well, not, not as much that uh, how it gets to a price is, uh, speaks more towards momentum, velocity, um, especially if you're looking to, you know, come in and look for a reversal of turning point. So to me, it, when the, the move is being way. confirmed, okay, uh, tells me, uh, Dale, you know, you have time to try and bottom pick this or top pick this. It has to either go through a, an accumulation stage where uh, lower lows are not being confirmed by momentum because markets rarely bottom when moves are being confirmed by momentum. And, you know, I'm an RSI guy too, Steve. Yeah. The speaking real simple implicator. Yeah, speaking of the 10 year, yeah. uh, here we are almost threatening the 2017 uh, September low. Yeah. And, you know, if we break below this 2013, uh, then we're going to be talking about levels, uh, yields in essence, that we haven't seen since 2016. So quite a big, uh, you know, 180 degrees uh, reversal here, right? Yeah. Everybody was bullish up there and we're now pushing the lows. Of course, somebody can claim that, you know, the exact opposite is, come, is happening now. I mean, everybody's now, you know, looking lower. Perhaps we're, you know, there is some trying... divergence on the daily. Yeah, there, there is, there is, yeah. there is, there is indeed not, some divergence. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. The, not on the short-term TFs. Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised in, if in the short term we find some kind of a, a support here and we rebound. I wouldn't be surprised at all because it's, you know, it's already overdone this move both in the, uh, you know, U.S. Treasuries and in the bonds. And, you know, something in particular that I was uh, looking at yesterday night, actually, is let me open a chart of the S&P that I don't have any drawings on it because it's going to be much easier to see. So let's choose this one, for example. Okay. So let's choose this one. And let's overlay on this. The 10-year... Treasuries. Okay. So now check this out. Clearly, what is regular here in the vast majority of the cases is, is an inverse correlation, okay, inverse relationship. 
but lately, as you've seen, I mean, exactly since we actually, since like um, a few weeks after we bottomed out, after, uh, you know, this move lower that we had following that uh, crazy run higher uh, in the S&P and risk assets in, in the end, uh, up to the end of 2018, we have seen a relationship between um, uh, treasuries and the S&P that is mostly a positive one, okay? So there have been some periods in the past as well. One of them being here, just before we picked in 2007, right? Check out this period. I mean, from the highs that we had in 2007, uh, you know, from June 2007 to the highs, we had a positive correlation once again between, uh, you know, the S&P and um, Treasuries. And we know how this ended. Of course, this is not an indicator on its own, but it's something, that, you know, that I am paying attention to because I don't think this positive, even, even in the short term, you can see it here if I zoom in, you can see how positive the correlation has been here, right, between Treasuries and um, uh, and and the S and P that's that's quite strange and I don't expect that this uh, can go on for longer especially today that I mentioned before <laughs> we have an extra element we have uh, gold also being beat up at the same time also quite uh, strange behavior having to do with intermarket um, relationships okay speaking of gold um, Blake said what was to be said. Very briefly, I want to show it. Yes, we're pushing again towards this 1360 uh, area, but I would be a little bit careful here because I also see the possibility of an ascending wedge uh, being in play here. So let's see what's going to happen from here. Definitely a break above 1360, 1365 is going to be a huge bullish development. Um, but, you know, I would be quite cautious ahead of that area, uh, needless to say, especially ahead of what's happening tomorrow with the Fed. If the Fed, for some reason, comes out, you know, less dovish than the market currently expects, especially considering uh, how important this technical level is, uh, you can end up seeing like a huge, huge reversal here in, in gold. Now, um, silver, obviously not quite obvious, uh, you know, as, as gold, okay? So, obviously, if you want to be short one of the two, that would be gold, uh, given the fact that it's very close to, you know, key key resistance. Of course, you know, important resistance is also this 38.2 for silver, uh, but, you know, it's, it's absolutely not the same as what we've been seeing with, um, with gold. Um, another pair before we go to the majors that I was, you know, closely monitoring, especially today, since earlier today, actually, um, is the euro pound because the euro pound has actually entered now, um, you know, an area of resistance that is quite uh, important. You can see here today, um, you know, we even bridged through intraday from the 78.6. Um, you know, as you see from my drawings, I expected the reaction from there since, you know, many days ago. We did have an initial reaction lower. Now we're more or less unchanged on the day. So uh, what we have in place now is a spinning top, which is an indecision candle. Of course, it's very, very early on the day to, uh, you know, to give it any significance. But even if we assume that we're going to break above the 78.6, I would still expect that, you know, uh, the euro pound would have a major hurdle ahead because we also have this uh, large descending channel. You can see it here. Um, you know, it's resistance currently passing from 90 cents. So another 50 pips to the upside, you know, depends on what kind of trading you do. It's not anything big. So, you know, that is why I'm actually going to start selling the euro pound here. Um, you know, uh, for details, I'm going to write it in the chat room once this webinar is done. Um, looking for at least a temporary reaction lower. So I do think that the euro pound is is interesting and does uh, provide and produce quite a nice uh, opportunity here. Um, of course, it depends on what kind of trader you are, as I said, but you know, this is my uh, point of view. Now, having to do with EURUSD, not much to say there. Uh, Blake covered it. 
Uh, having to do with the pound, though, Blake didn't happen to speak about the pound today. I have to tell you that, uh, you know, the fact that we've broken to new lows is obviously, um, you know, another significant sign that we have a bearish continuation happening here. I know that it's very oversold. It's not that I would advocate for somebody to be selling it here. You you could be selling it, you know, higher when once we broke below this um, triangle. But even when that happened, it wouldn't be easy to uh, get in a decision like that because we had this descending wedge. So even an initial pullback um, could be uh, viewed as an opportunity to buy for another leg higher. I was also thinking that that, that was a possible scenario um, as it seems it isn't. That's one of the good aspects of being quite careful and not jumping the gun. If you remember, I was quite actively looking uh, to be short dollar against you know, a basket of currencies, assuming that the dollar would um, you know, keep on moving lower because we had this, the first sign that we were breaking lower and that happened when we actually broke below this purple ascending trend line. You can see it here. Um, but then we never got the second thing happening, which was penetrating through this ascending channels uh, support and the 200 DMA. As you see, the confluence of those two, the 200 daily moving average and this ascending uh, channels support is what actually um, stopped the move lower from the pair and we've had this rebound since. Now, does this make me outright bullish from here? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so, especially now we're testing again this uh, resistance area at 97.70. So I would definitely be buying uh, dollars here on this resistance and especially ahead of the Fed. Um, so I do think that we're currently in a consolidation of some kind. And, and you know, unless or until we break either above 98.30 or below uh, this previous low at 96. Um, 60, I would rather stay away from uh, making like long-term, uh, medium to long-term bets of about, you know, the fate of the dollar. Uh, I am a long-term uh, bear having to do with the fate of the dollar. I do think that the dollar's next big move is going to be to the downside, but that in no case means that it can't move higher first, right? So, you know, my long-term thesis doesn't affect in any way my medium-term thesis because, uh, you know, simply it, it, it can end up losing the money. So, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for a technical event here, which for the time being we don't have as long as we don't have it. Of course, if you are to favor one side, it has to be the, uh, the upside, right? Because the dollar has been uh, and has remained very, very well bid, as we've shown many times since February 2018. So, you know, we, we, we are approaching one and a half years um, that, you know, the dollar has been uh, in an uptrend. Momentum has definitely waned, but, you know, from having a wane momentum to calling a reversal, you know, there is a big distance between, between the two of them. Now, having to do with, this, with the S&P, um, we're obviously pushing higher from this consolidation. Um, now, do I think that we're headed directly from here to new highs? Uh, the short-term structure doesn't tell me something like that. I would probably expect from here or from a little bit higher some type of, you know, pullback before perhaps seeing uh, more strength. So I wouldn't be buying the S&P here, okay? Uh, as simple as that. I don't think we're going to be pushing new highs before uh, some type of a pullback because what we had recently can, can't even be... Um, characterized as a pullback. You can mostly call it a consolidation, okay? It was a horizontal consolidation. Um, I shorted that because on the four-hour chart, we had a, an ascending wedge. I got really lucky because my target w got triggered intraday before we got a big reversal. I also had a pattern in play for that, so people that are subscribers know it. Some of them definitely uh, followed it. Um, but, yeah, it doesn't even, uh, you know, qualify in my mind as a you know, as a corrective move, just as a horizontal consolidation. Um, levels of interest, one of them we're testing now, 29.10, and above that, 29.30 um, is the next one. Uh, then it's all down highs after that. Definitely, though, uh, the move that we had lower, I mean, the larger move that we had lower from 
uh, May, uh, from the beginning of May to the beginning of June, this one month uh, move lower has definitely contracted character, um, sorry, corrective characteristics. So in general, um, I would still favor the upside. Okay, just not in the short term buying here. I don't think it makes any sense. Um, I think a pullback would probably provide uh, good buying opportunities. Um, just close your eyes and buy. You know how that is. I mean, it doesn't make sense from a fundamental perspective, but it is what it is. Um, the DAX, unsurprisingly, we're moving higher here. Um, you know, the DAX clearly an ABC move lower here as well. Um, we ended up consolidating for a few days uh, around the horizontal support resistance area, and now we're moving higher again. Obviously, Draghi's comments today and the fact that those comments also um, produced um, a pullback for the euro, both of those are assisting the upside. That's why we, at some point we were lower on the day in the DAX, and now we're much, much higher, in essence, living behind an outside white candle. Most likely, that's how I expect the day to end. I don't expect, like, um, for the index to go back to negative for the day. Um, so I do think that's going to be quite a good day for the DAX. Um, you know, posting um, quite a bullish candle, as I said, and uh, signaling that, uh, you know, we have more uh, upside coming. Uh, with the next area of resistance obviously being this previous um, high at 12,450, roughly that's uh, where it is. Um, let me go ahead and have a look at a few of your questions. Close this. Open the chat. Let's see. One way market whole year, USD Swiss and JPY is strong. Dirty market, USD knock, please. Yeah, uh, not a bad idea. Let's have a look at um, what's happening with USD CAD, USD knock, and crude, by the way. So, um, USD CAD, USD CAD showing quite bullish. Um, I thankfully uh, closed, as I said that day on the webinar, I closed my attempt to be short. I had said on the webinar that I'm probably going to close it because I didn't see any follow through and I didn't like that. Um, so I got rid of it because I would have been um, hurt. You know, sometimes you need to keep an eye open for, you know, what's happening if you get what you're expecting from a resistance area and, you know, that's not what happened. And I have to admit that despite wanting to see um, lower levels, not a lot lower. I was looking for 131.20 because we had a nice confluence of supports down there. So I wanted to see that uh, support tested, but you know, you're not always getting what you want. So USD CAD is showing quite a nice rebound, uh, currently testing a, ho a horizontal resistance area once again, but I wouldn't be trying to fade it here because there is quite a decent chance that you know we're going to keep moving higher this time actually uh testing the resistance i was looking for initially which was that 136.60 area so why not we might have a move towards 136.60 um don't buy the right on the resistance 134.40 is resistance but a little pullback you know towards 133.50 probably a nice buying opportunity uh for a move up towards 135.50 Next, 135.40, and after that, 136.60. Now, having to do with the USD knock, uh, nothing has really changed here because USD knock was not as rude as USD card, meaning it didn't first post some kind of a fake uh, breakout. If you remember, it was quite clear that you need to respect this confluence of supports at 860, triple confluence of supports, horizontal support area, um, the 50% FIB of the last move higher, and most importantly, if I zoom out, you can clearly see it here, an ascending channels support, a channel that dates back to the beginning of 2018. So, um, you know, there would be no way that I would be looking for lower levels in the USD knock as long as we traded above 860 and, you know, this, this area held. So, in all honesty, of course, we remain trapped in the range. Let's call it now 860 to 880. Uh, so it's not that I would be saying, you know, buy it here because 880 is a big resistance. 
but it looks to me that it's more likely that uh, 880 is going to break to the upside uh, before 860 breaks to the downside. Okay, um, so we remain range bound, uh, but an eventual break higher seems a lot more likely to me than anything else. And once we break above 880, then there is quite a lot of room for us to move higher before we can even retest this one and a half year old ascending channels resistance. I mean, just to, just to put it in context, that channel resistance currently passes roughly from 913, 914. So, you know, in a percentage, which I prefer instead of pips, from a percentage perspective, that's almost another 4% upside. Not bad at all, because we're talking about currencies, right? 4% move for a currency is quite a significant move. Uh, let me go back to your question. Sorry, I have to browse through pages, but <coughs> as you know, for some reason, my Windows uh, PC doesn't like um, uh, Zoom. YouTube stream just died. Okay, let me inform people about that. Okay, let me see what other information. USD Swiss, yeah, I forgot about that. Let's have a look at the USD Swiss. Forex Gal says, 1,000 more soldiers going to the Middle East. She's absolutely right. I forgot to mention that in, in the news. Yes, we do have Trump is sending 1,000 soldiers, uh, you know, uh, towards Iran, in essence. So let's see if we're going to end up having, uh, you know, any further escalation there. Let me see the Q&A as well. Uh, yeah, Blaker's charts haven't changed a bit over 16 years, and I still don't understand them. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, says Rick. Um, Steve, hi. Could you talk about the Kiwi and the Aussie? Absolutely, we're going to do that as well. Please look at Kiwi Yen. Yes. Uh, oh, my page is frozen? I'm just seeing your comments. Are you sure? Because I'm, you know, I'm on my MacBook and I keep browsing left and right. Can somebody confirm? <laughs> Coach? Okay, so, okay, so it's not the computer. Okay, you confirm it's frozen. Okay, uh, okay, fine. Let me stop sharing and I'll try resetting. <clears throat> okay, let me start sharing again and see if it makes any difference. Okay, what about now? Still black. Black or frozen? I have black. Joe has black. <sighs> okay, coach. Not much I can do. As it seems, my connection for some reason doesn't like Zoom, although I had no problems with go to webinar, but... Hmm. It's not much I can do about it. Let's see. Okay. It should it should then freeze at some point. There it did. Uh, wait. It just did. It just did. Okay. Yes. Good. You're good. That's good. Okay. So uh, let's go because we had quite a lot of requests. So let's go ahead. So you can see the Aussie, right, uh, Coach? Yes. Okay. Bye. So. Bye. Bye. Buy it. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, to, be, to be honest, not that far away from yeah. the truth. Yeah. Because we're I, testing yeah. a multi-year low at the moment. So yeah. some want to buy it, right? If for some reason you want to buy it, you might want to do it now. Now, would I be buying it? No, I wouldn't be buying it. Why? Because if you remember, even when we were rebounding, 
I was very, very skeptical, and I was even writing in my analysis that as long as it remained below that confluence of resistances at 70, uh, 20, 70, 30, 70 cents, I mean, 30, um, you know, that we didn't yet have any, you know, big level breaking to the upside to say, oh, you know, we have a big reversal in hand, and we did get rejected from there. Uh, testament to that is that we're testing now new lows. And, you know, as I said, next stop now is this uh, spike low that we had at 67, um, 46, uh, which, which in essence was a multi-year low. We didn't close there, of course. It was just an intraday spike. So I have to admit that, you know, you have to be very, very careful because the Aussie looks very, very weak. And the same deal... Maybe the is, Aussie Kiwi will be the tell. Maybe, but the same deal is, is true with the Kiwi. Uh, Kiwi never made it to my confluence of resistances. It, it came, you know, a few pips, like 20, 30 pips uh, close to that. Uh, the equivalent level I was looking for here was the 67.10 area. Unfortunately, we didn't make it there. Um, no, actually, I don't care because it's not that I would have sold. I had other things in mind at that, mo at that point. But for those of you listening in, you might want to sell, to sell there. Um, didn't happen. We're testing the lows once again. Uh, after that, we have that 64.20 area, which is a multi-year low, October 2018 low. We have to go back to 2016 to find lower lows. Okay, so both of them, still look quite bearish. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that would make me blindly jump into buying them because there is no reversal signal yet. The same is true for the Kiwi Yen. Kiwi Yen broke down after multiple tests of this 7230 support area. We even spiked down in the day in that spike, but we didn't close below that uh, area. After, so after multiple tests of that support, we finally break down uh, below it in May. We came up, retested that uh, area of support as resistance. We got rejected. We are at new lows. And, you know, the next uh, support area is above 69, uh, 69, 69.10, um, which was the spike low. So also here in the Kiwi Yen, so far, absolutely no indication of a reversal coming. So I need to see something totally totally different to start believing, uh, you know, that something is changing. Until that happens, the path of least resistance remains lower. Now, there is a different kind of question. Is there any risk reward so you can actually sell it? The answer is no. There is no risk reward at the moment to sell it, but that doesn't mean that you should fade it. Okay. Now, having to do with the other question that we had that had to do with the USD Swiss. Here is the USD Swiss. USD Swiss rebound it rebounding from horizontal support area um, after falsely breaking below this uh, multi-year ascending wedge so that was quite a nasty move from the market uh, we are approaching now previous lows here in general this parity area has um, you know quite a lot of resistances first of all it's psychological it's parity right second of all it's a 38.2 um, third, a little bit higher, just a little bit higher, like 10 pips higher. We have this previous low there. So um, I want to see if there's going to be some kind of a reaction uh, from here. Of course, that would also mean that, you know, in order for, to have a sustained reaction from here, that would mean that the euro would, the euro USD would have to rebound from current levels. The only way that something like that is going to happen, we come back to the Fed again, is if... Um, we get some kind of uh, big move coming from the Fed tomorrow. In essence, the Fed disappointing having to do with um, expectations about uh, monetary policy. So the Fed coming out more hawkish than expected. Okay. Um, other than that, you you know, usually false move might be a good indication that the opposite is happening. Um, but as I said before, be careful, parity and a little bit higher, the 1005 area, both of them areas of resistance. So in the short term, I wouldn't definitely be buying here. But, you know, the comment of our friend that, you know, it's a one-way train so far, yeah, more or less it has proved 
true if you you know disregard the um, short medium term moves. And here is Euro Swiss as well, by the way. Uh, once again, uh, near uh, the uh, low part of this range. So be a little bit careful here. I'm pretty sure that the S&P, one way or another, is supporting um, the Euro Swiss uh, near this 111.50 area. Um, so we're quite close here from a risk reward perspective. Looking for a rebound is not a bad idea, just from a risk reward perspective, uh, as I said. Um, one more pair that is also currently disagreeing with what we see from uh, the S&P uh, as the USD yen. So, for example, we see a risk on environment, but, uh, you know, um, currencies that are usually correlated, currency pairs that are usually correlated with risk on risk of moves do not agree with what we've been seeing. Um, let me see if we have any more questions. I saw an article about the Brazilian real rallying. If the money flows out of the peso, because usually the peso and real are correlated, but right now they're not correlated. Any thoughts? Uh, we've already uh, we're all already overdue for the interview. Um, they are highly correlated. Um, I'm going to have to have a look and let you know tomorrow. Please remind me tomorrow. Coach? Uh, you may be able to answer that question. Uh, Rodney, are you in the house? I've typed your name. If you could say something in chat. I don't see you in here. I know he was excited to do it. Um, he retweeted it. It's in his stream. But I don't see him. Any chance he he's in with an alias? Or... I, I've sent him messages. Anyway, uh, if you want to continue, I'm not getting any responses. Uh, you see anything in chat? Rodney, are you here? It's showtime. So I would say, Steve, that um, he's not living up to his handle. At, uh, his handle is Rod has spoken. So I guess speaking, we could wrap it. Speak, speaking of the peso, by the way, keep in mind that the peso is in a long-term symmetrical triangle. Like the N was. Like the N is. Yeah, a very long. And let's see. Yeah, you can, you can view this some time ago, a long time ago, last time we had a look at the Brazilian Real. It had the potential of a large head and shoulders formation here, but that's why we have to respect necklines that never broke down, so that never got triggered. So yes, this looks like a large symmetrical triangle as well. There you go. So as you see, yeah, I mean, they, they look more or less identical from a technical perspective at the moment. So I would have to say that for both for the Peso and the Brazilian Real, you, you have two choices here from a technical perspective and two choices only. One of them is trade the range. So every time we approach triangles resistance, sell it. Every time we approach triangle support, buy it. Or wait for a breakout and you know, sell it if it breaks down, or buy it if it breaks higher. <coughs> so, coach. So, coach. I want to. Uh, here I am, and um, looks like uh, we have uh, a no show. So. Too bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, you know, I reach out to people, Steve, that aren't necessarily the most famous and don't have a ton of followers to, you know, give them a little exposure and visibility and uh, it's a unique opportunity for them. And so sometimes people get nervous about it anyway. So uh, I, the rest of the week, I have a great interview tomorrow and Mark Yusko will be with us uh, Thursday. Oh, Mark is going to be with us. Thursday yeah. Again. Mr. Nice. Uh, Bitcoin. He's probably feeling a lot better than, the last time I talked to him when Absolutely. Bitcoin was 4,000 uh, or lower, you know, no so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, old. yeah. Uh, I don't think it's fair for Mark, you know, that I disagree with him in 
cryptocurrencies. He's he's a firm believer, but you know, I'm 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 extremely skeptical to say the least. But irrespective of that, he has a very, very good mind and he understands economics. And he's yeah. very at that and nobody, nobody can claim otherwise uh, you know uh, despite what you think about cryptocurrencies or not yeah and uh, it's always fun to have mark too so you know i could ask him anything one of those guys yeah and, he, he's and i'm a guy sure that, you'll have a question or two yeah and he's a guy that has done excellent even before cryptocurrencies ever existed so you know yeah. his value doesn't he, he's not like a uh, you know um uh, how, how do they call them shooting stars yeah yeah, you don't yeah. manage uh, uh, the, the trust fund for Notre Dame University unless you have some credentials. Exactly. So uh, that's going to be a wrap, everyone, for Turnaround Tuesday. And remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. And bless yourself with a membership at Forex Analytics. So like right now or all through face, you could be in our private members chat and have additional ideas going on live all day you can ask blake a question steve will be in there so after phase let me ask you guys uh there's still some people left here um do you ever wish that you could uh like during the session you go what about no what about silver what about this do you don't you wish you could after phase ends continue this conversation not have to wait till tomorrow spend a few bucks and have that you're trying to make a money in the market uh you ha you're either going to invest in yourself and put yourself around good traders or you're going to make the donation to the market it's your choice so um steve another great roundup great to have you back and thank you coach yeah so uh everyone uh really uh tomorrow's a big day so you'll be prepped for the Fed and FACE, and people are prepping in our members' chat room right now. Join them. And that's going to be a wrap, and I'm going to end the meeting. So thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Uh, oh, I just have one comment to Joshua. If the cost of the chat room is too high for new traders, you're probably not suitable to trade. Because, okay, I've been, I, I want to talk about this before I say goodbye to everyone, okay? If uh, you don't have enough risk capital to, and it should be risk capital, and that means when you open your account, whether it's FX or CFDs, anything else, uh, you've written that money off, okay? And if 100 bucks is a lot to you, I really don't think you're suitable to be in the market. My opinion, you know, I mean, some people like to play penny. Uh, okay. I think it's a good idea until you're really, you have a nice war chest to do it. Okay. That's it. It should be, it should be risk capital. And uh, really, I don't think uh, people that have less than 10 K to risk, should be trading my opinion from being around for over 30 years and those are regulations when you're soliciting clients too so anyway uh good luck to you with your micros and i'll see everyone tomorrow adios